beggars, found on city streets around the world, often ignored, sometimes helped, frequently moved on, but always hoping for the charity of others. So how do different cultures respond to their pleas? Al Jazeera correspondent Barnaby Phillips went to find out. They are the poorest of the poor, and you can find them all over the world, in the wealthiest parts of the West and in Asia's poorest slums. I'm on a journey through the developed and developing worlds to see how very different countries cope with those at the bottom of society. Do we help them? Do we ignore them? Do we simply despise them? I've come to Manila in the Philippines, and like many cities in Asia, it's growing fast, but it is a place of stunning contrasts, shacks and new rising tower blocks. But there is one way in which these two worlds, rich and poor, meet, and that is through the most simple economic activity of all, begging. In Manila, nobody is too young to beg. A small boy learning to survive in a big city. JC, five years old, is looking for his two older brothers. He has an idea where he can find them, a street corner where the traffic slows down, fleeting contact between rich and poor, a place of opportunity. Neil John is the middle brother. At seven years old, he's a seasoned beggar. So Neil John, tell me, where, where do you beg exactly? And do you try and look for certain kinds of cars? Are there good cars that give more money? or? Do you say anything, Neil John, or you just knock on the window? Here, every day after school, the three brothers and their friends beg for money. Their mother, Judith, watches on. When your kids come out here begging on the streets, what are you worried about for them? Judith lives nearby in an illegal settlement. So this is home? Yes. How many hours do your children beg after school? How long do they do that work? Minsan pito, pitong oras bago sila umuwi. Pag ano kasi oras sila umuwi at 9, 9 ng gabi na uwi na kami kasi pagdating ng sarado ng hyper, umuwi na kami kasi wala nang ilaw dun. Minsan po sila nasabi yan na Nasaan ba yung mga magulang nyo? Bakit kayo naghanap buhay? Sabi mo sa magulang mo, sa maghanap buhay. Ganun. Masakit kasi yung naranasan ko nung bata ko, naranasan din nila. Kaya sabi ko, hindi naman po habang buhay, ganito kami. Kung bibigyan lang ako ng chance na magtrabaho, matrabaho po. At least these children have their mother. No matter how tough their lives, they have a home, love, and support. Thousands of children in Manila have no parents to care for them. They survive in gangs however they can. Often, it's easier to just escape reality. They're living on the streets, they, they work, they play here, they, they do the jam sessions with the solvent, the glue, and uh, they've been neglected, abused at home. And most of them are begging. This is Butch. He grew up on these streets. He lived a life of crime and begging. Now, in his early 50s, he's dedicated to helping these kids survive. I'm going to one of the uh, street families here. I told them, OK, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you some clothes when I get back. Butch used to work for an NGO, but got fed up with the bureaucracy. 
He feels he can do more good working directly on the streets. He hands out clothes, medicine, and tips for survival. Coach, there's a kid lying there. Do you know that little boy? Yeah, this kid, uh, I think yeah, he, he ran away from home, could have been abused. So he's here on, on the streets to fend for his own. At present, he's sleeping in the streets because of friends also. And I think he's high with solvent, high on glue. Probably he's going to wake up before lunchtime, and then he's going to beg to, to look for food. You know? 16-year-old Danny Lin and Jose are two of the kids that Butch looks out for. Begging is supposedly illegal in the Philippines, but these two boys like to think of themselves as performers, brightening the day of Manila's long-suffering commuters riding the jeepneys. <laughs> On a good day, the two boys might make five dollars between them. Ano po, pag alam po namin, ano, mabait po sila, tapos bibigyan po namin. Yung iba po kasi, nagsasabihan kami magdanakaw. Hindi po kasi po mas maganda na po kumanta para po. Tapos kahit di po sila magbigay, at least po napakita po namin yung talit namin sa kanila. They ride the jeepneys across the city. And yet there are parts of Manila that will always be out of bounds to Danny Lin and Jose. Is this the real Manila? Absolutely not. I think this space near the stock exchange really represents the kind of inequality present in Manila. So Dr. We Nicole Curato studies the relationship between rich and poor in the Philippines. Center. So if we were here on a weeknight, for example, you'll see a lot of millennials here working around financial centers with purchasing power, able to get a Starbucks coffee right there. But then you move a few kilometers away from here, then you can really see kids begging who probably don't even have a shot at finishing high school. These are families who have their own social bonds. And especially when you think about the kind of life they have in the streets, it's not just about purely begging. A lot of these children live off the streets and they contribute to the ecosystem of an urban society like Manila. These are kids who watch for your car, make sure no one robs your tires. So in a way, there's this symbiotic relationship between urban dwellers and street children. This relationship can usually be seen here, the promenade of Manila Bay. It's a popular tourist spot, so an ideal place to beg. Except that something has changed here in the past few days. It's strangely empty. My visit to Manila coincided with a summit of world leaders. This mega city went into lockdown. And not for the first time, an event that shone a spotlight on the city spurred the authorities into action. It's, uh, it's so clean. It's uh, well manicured. <laughs> I mean, there could be a uh, hundred of street dwellers, street families walking around here. Uh, they're ashamed to see this because this is the main area where the APEC uh, VIPs will be passing. Last week, um, as one of my kids had been saying, the street families and the street adults, street children in this area, they were all uh, rescued, as they call it, rescued or arrested by the police. Fear of being picked up by the authorities spread through the streets. Judith's children are on the alert. As the police approach, they flee around the corner. Nine-year-old John Paul is Judith's oldest child. The government's DSWD, or Department of Social Welfare and Development, is responsible for helping the poorest people in the Philippines. It's also blamed by Human Rights Watch for helping to organize what it called the cynical cleanup of Manila before the summit. First of all, the cleanup is really, I'm sorry to say this, a media hype. Because we have registered 4,450 homeless street families into the program. That cannot be done in two months, not even in three months. We've been doing this since 2013. It is true that the energy to do something uh, more 
uh, in a coordinated way, in a collaborative way, uh, gets fired up when there are visitors or events. That I mean, is true. It shouldn't take President Obama. No. Uh, the, the government should care about its own people. Uh, the government should care about its own people, and we have very good programs that have shown a lessening of children in conflict with the law, no children begging in their streets. Many of the people rescued from the streets by the DSWD and the police are brought here to the Jose Favela Reception Center. This is one of a handful of such centers in Manila, intended to provide temporary accommodation for street people. It has a bed capacity of 222. When we visit, there are 565 people sleeping here. The center is divided into wards for women, families, single men, and the mentally ill. Some of them are locked up for their own safety, we were told, and this includes children. Is it right to put children in this place? It, it doesn't seem a very good way to make children better for them to be locked in here. They're allowed to go outside, sir. Uh, but uh, we have time. At this point, we were preparing for the dinner time. So the house there, they collect all the kids, uh, all the and make a challenge for clients that keep on roaming around for the dinner time. So, so the children are not normally in here. Yes. It was difficult to talk openly to people in the centre, but several told us they preferred to be out on the streets. Pag may mga kumakain sa labas, sa mga kantil, sa mga kunyari, pishbulan, kwekwekan, gumatlang kami sa burgeran. Pag inangihingi kami, karamihan may nagbibigay. Pero sa kali kasi, doon marami kang ano talaga, may kilala at makakasalamuha. The authorities didn't catch Judith's family. And with the summit over, Manila life returns to normal. Children out on the streets begging to survive. There is money in this city, but it's mostly in the hands of a privileged few. With inadequate resources to lift everyone out of poverty, the government looks the other way as people fend for themselves. Six thousand miles away in Sweden, on a bitterly cold day, it's a different story. Here, no one's breaking the law by begging. Some beggars even drive cars. It's 9 a.m. and a friend is taking Catalin to what he hopes will be a lucrative pitch. He's traveled across a continent to be here. Originally from Romania, now he asks for cash in one of Europe's richest countries. The living in Sweden is very good. Romania is a catastrophe, very catastrophe. They have for me three kids here. They have the money to transfer to Romania, my baby. I've come here because, unlike the Philippines, there are funds in Sweden to help the poorest in society. It's famous for its generous welfare system. But despite that safety net, there are many beggars here, too, in cities across the country, and they get a mixed reception. It's a problem because it's not a, a view of the street we are used to seeing. And it's, a, it's not a common Swedish thing either. And it's. It's difficult because it's poor people and it's people um, in a difficult situation. Yes. Yeah. It's sad to see the beggars, but I think they're, they're so common nowadays, so you just walk by and you don't think about it that much. It's okay to give money to somebody who's disabled, don't have an arm or something. Okay, this guy cannot work and stuff. But when you, when you see a grown person who's uh, capable for work, Work your money, man. Because you know how the people are here. Maybe a little corner. It's been an unprofitable day for Catalin, and he's heading home. For now, that's this squatter camp on the outskirts of Malmo in southern Sweden. 
The people here are Roma, a dispersed ethnic group with roots in Central and Eastern Europe. There are some 160 of them on this site, living in shacks and caravans. Some came in search of work, but the majority look for handouts on the streets. Dorina was begging on the streets in Italy, but Sweden's strong economy lured her north. Gina's children are all in Romania, being cared for by her in-laws, while she begs on the streets of Malmo. My work is begging because I came to do nothing else. I don't have the opportunity, the chance to do some, something else. I look from the shoes, the people, and the clothes, and I say how elegant, and I make a calculation how much money give, and I am just thinking, I am just. I can't do nothing else, I can speak, I just stay. I just stay down, I don't look in eyes the people, I, yes, I am feel very, very shame. Very, very shame. Roma beggars in Europe are often accused of belonging to organized criminal gangs. I wanted to know if this was the case with Gina. Are you part of an organized gang? No. No, we don't have any boss. Do you have to give any part of the money you no. make no. to, to no. somebody in the Roma no. community? No. Do you keep it yourself? Yes. The, the Romania country, he can't help Roma. Uh, why? Because we don't have all the school. And if we want to go to beg, maybe you make uh, like one crony a day, and um, so then you can support right. to be like this. And then we go out from our country to beg in. Well, it's very hard. But for Gina and others who fled poverty to come here, recent events have made life more difficult. It's not just the Roma who are the new arrivals in Malmo. Malmo is also an entry point for the huge numbers of Syrian refugees coming into Sweden. And those are the people who the city authorities are really focused on helping. Malmo's train station, full of exhausted Syrians and Afghans. Relative to the size of its population, Sweden is taking more refugees than almost any other country in Europe. And this is affecting attitudes towards the Roma beggars. Yes, we are becoming less tolerant, definitely. You can't separate it from the whole refugee situation. In people's minds, these two issues are blending together. Although the Roma immigrants are fleeing poverty and discriminations, people like Syrian refugees are fleeing war. It's two different things, but in people's minds, it becomes just strangers. It feeds into the xenophobia. Of course, this is an explosive situation, and it needs to be dealt with somehow. In Malmo, the authorities have decided that the squatters have to go. This is like a, it's like a protest <laughs> to don't touch my home. So this poster is for, uh, we put in all the house here. The city council has issued an eviction notice. I think in, from Sunday, four o'clock, it's supposed to be out people here. We have paper from the Malmö city, mm -hmm. the politicians, because it's very dangerous for them to live here. It's, it's like, uh, it's better these people living in the street. How can it be better to live in the street and have here warm and something to make food and sleep? I head to the capital, Stockholm. I want to put Katalin's question to the head of a government task force 
responsible for dealing with Roma from other EU countries. It would be impossible for Sweden to offer the entire welfare system here to everyone who is poor in, in Europe. So therefore, the, the, the solution, the long-term solution, must be found in their home countries. These people have to survive, but effectively, you're saying they can't do that here in Sweden. They have to leave if all they can do is beg. No, they are allowed to stay, uh, and we won't have a uh, ban against begging. I think that's a bad idea. But if you come to Sweden, you must find yourself a legal way of uh, living. You cannot uh, suddenly make a settlement in parks and private property. Swedish law must be upheld. The Roma in the Malmo camp tried to contest the eviction notice without success. Now they have to decide what to do. It's the scheduled day of the eviction. As the Roma wait for the police to arrive, they're joined by Swedish supporters. But some in Malmo want to see the Roma moved on. I think it is a big problem for Sweden that the people can live that way. They can go back to their own country, not in Sweden. Alltså de ska inte tigga, de kan söka hjälp som alla andra. Och då finns hjälp att få. Ja, det är ju privat märke. Jag menar, börjar vi här, då får vi ett helt öga kanske här. Och jag menar, stadsparken, stadsparken. Jag menar, jag menar, sån utveckling kan vi inte heller ha. Det måste ju stoppas på något vis, tycker jag. The deadline passes with no sign of the police. The Roma and their supporters celebrate long into the night. They think they've won a reprieve. But even if they do manage to stay in this camp, the political voices ranged against them are growing louder. These are Sweden's parliament buildings, and I've come here to meet a member of parliament whose party is trying to make begging illegal. When we reach that scale of begging, and uh, when we have this kind of begging where other EU citizens come to Sweden, that's, that creates a lot of problems. Adam Mittenan is from the Sweden Democrats, a nationalist party growing in popularity that wants to stop free movement within the EU. We have to make something, and uh, legislation against begging is something that uh, more, more European country has been doing, and it has worked well for them. And we are looking at those examples, and we want to see them in Sweden as well. So we have to make a voice heard, especially when we have our government not doing anything. And in the meantime, it's just tough luck for these people who are begging here. Well, there is a tough luck for many people in the world, but this is a situation we have to handle. Two nights later, back in Malmo, the police finally turn up at the Roma camp. It's 4 a.m. in the morning. Swedish activists are removed first, pulled out one by one, until only a few dozen Roma remain. By daybreak, the bulldozers have moved in, and the hemmed-in Roma are released. But they aren't going quietly. The crowd demands an audience with the city's head of social welfare, Karina Nilsson. As it becomes increasingly insistent, she appears but she's in no mood to compromise. Jag har varit oerhört tydlig hela tiden om att vi inte kommer att ta fram ett alternativ utan att vi erbjuder evakueringsboendet. But a few nights in a temporary hostel before being sent back to Romania is not what the Roma are looking for. They bed down for the night and the standoff continues over the days that follow. Eventually, the police move in once again. So they were kicked out of their camp. Their protest outside the town hall was pushed back. It was just a few dozen people here left under the bridge. 
Some people now saying they might go back to Romania, others saying they'll go elsewhere in Sweden, a few saying that they'll stay here and fight. Later that evening, as some accept the government's offer of a free bus ride home, and others stay and put a brave face on their plight, I'm struck by the paradox at the heart of my own journey. In the Philippines, begging is illegal but tolerated through necessity. Here in Sweden, it's legal but only grudgingly accepted. Two different responses to people who, for whatever reason, feel a need to ask others for charity. Underlying them both is a growing gap between the world's rich and poor. Well, we can lock beggars up, we can move them on, but beggars will always be with us.